focus on hitting your goals in every area of your business. Remember, the universe rewards the bold. A leader has to take the risks. Welcome to Wealth on the Beach podcast. My name is Daniel Alonzo. As always, I'm your host, bringing you some of the greatest minds in the world. We're talking uh, health, wealth, uh, money, and business. And uh, today, I have the pleasure of hanging out with a, a true superstar in business and uh, and just in life. Uh, I mean, this is gonna. I, I've been really looking forward to this. Uh, interview. Um, he is a best-selling author. Wait, D- Daniel, who, who are you going to have on? I can't wait to meet this guy. I know. He's coming. He's coming, man. He's <laughs> coming. Motivational speaker, filmmaker. His name is Greg Reed. And so uh, he's written 28 books. So 28 books, man. What's that like writing 28 books? Well, actually, it's 28 bestsellers. I've been published in 108. 18 books, 45 languages around the world. Uh, right now, at any given time, I have four titles at Barnes and Noble bookstores, one at airports around the country, at Kinko's, things of this nature. And it's pretty neat because people want to be a best selling author, but the secret is to become a back selling author. Have you ever heard of that? No, no, explain that. What does that mean? Well, if you ever go to like Barnes and Noble, it's the last bookstore in the world, they have 5,000 titles at the store. Uh, 4,500 of them are back-selling books. That means that they're always there. They're evergreen. So if you buy Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you take it off the shelf, it triggers a system to replace it immediately. It's called the back-seller. The best-seller is the empty shelf on the side that they just rotate whatever's popular at that time, but it's like the one-hit wonder they come and go. So the goal is to become a back-selling author because that's when you know you've truly stood the test of time. Love that. Love that. And Think and Grow Rich, I know you have a lot to do with Think and Grow Rich has been a part of, uh, you know, what's made you. So tell us a little bit about Think and Grow Rich and how, how has it affected your life? Yeah, well, back in the day in 1908, Napoleon Hill was given a letter by this guy named Carnegie to go meet his friends. And, you know, he wrote the first ever formula for success. A hundred years later to 2008, the surviving family, the grandkids in Napoleon Hill and the foundation gave me the same type letter. So I have a Willy Wonka ticket to meet any human. So my full-time job is to travel the planet to meet the most powerful and influential people and then tell their stories in books and film. Not a bad racket if you can get it. Not, not, not bad, not bad. You know, and I, I know that you're, uh, you have a relationship with Sharon Lecter, which she's a friend of mine as well. And uh, Sharon Lecter also has that little Willy Wonka ticket, I think, as well. Um, I visited her in uh, in Arizona uh, about a year and a half ago. So yeah, I mean, Think and Grow Rich, I think has affected, I mean, more people than we could ever imagine. I mean, through the years, I mean, the successful people of, you know, the planet, most of them had picked up that book at one time or another. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. And back to Sharon Lecter. So her and I wrote the books together, Think and Grow Rich, Three Feet from Gold. That's what started her connection with Napoleon Hill and my connection. It was all the same time we did that book together. In fact, when she finished uh, separating from the Rich Dad Poor Dad camp, uh, her and I collaborated to write the first ever uh, version of the updated version called Three Feet from Gold. And then she did Outwitting the Devil and I did Stickability. Then she did, uh, I think it was Think and Grow Rich for Women and I did Thoughts or Things with Bob Proctor. And then together again, we just did another one. Let me see if I can find it over here. It's called Success and Something Greater. Uh, where we went around the world and interviewed today's top thought leaders to find out what they did to create a life of sustained abundance. Now, check this one out. This was the last title that Napoleon Hill was supposed to do before he died, but never got a chance to. So the foundation gave it to Sharon and I, and we went around and talked to the most amazing human beings to find out what they did, um, you know, which is a little bit different. Can I tell one story from this book? Yeah, no, go, go. So, so we were sitting in, in Sharon's house. You've been to it. It's a big old mega mansion. And we're in the living room and there's this guy named Fred. We're interviewing him for this book. And I go, Fred, what was your biggest claim to fame? And he goes, well, I've done a lot of things for a lot of success. He goes, but my biggest thing is I, I, I created the uh, jet ski, you know, the two person sit down jet ski. And he goes, I sold the patent for 75 grand. And then he started talking about something else. And I went, what, Fred? <laughs> he goes, what? I go, you, you invented the jet ski? He goes, yeah. I go, you know, that's a billion dollar brand. He goes, absolutely. I'm very proud of it. He started talking something else. I went, Fred, I go, you sold it for 75 grand. That's got to kick you in the backside a little bit. And he stopped and everyone stopped to listen to this. And he goes, no. 
He says, at that time and moment, 75 grand was all the money in the world to me. He goes, I was about to lose the family home that you know was in our heritage and I got to keep the mortgage. He goes, I got my employees caught up that I couldn't. And it was the first time in my adult life, I slept all the way through the night. And he goes, I had free time, something I wasn't even aware of. And I went through the attic and started cleaning. And I found these little metal die cast cars I played with as a child. He said, a buddy of mine's in NASCAR. So I put his number on the side and I gifted it to him. Well, the other drivers got mad. They wanted one, so I made them for them too. Eventually, NASCAR came to me and bought the rights for over $151 million. And he goes, as an entrepreneur, sometimes we have to do a deal in order to get us through to do another deal. Wow, powerful. I like that. I like that. And so, um, so Greg, tell me, like, I mean, where did you grow up, man? What was, it, what was life like as Greg the child um, what was your childhood like? Well, if you turned your head to the back and saw your, your view, that's the same view I had. I grew up in the mean streets of a place called Del Mar, California, West Coast. I mean, I still skateboard every day, just a regular beach rat. You know, this is where I was born and raised. You know, there, you hear all those rag to riches stories and riches to rag stories. I don't have one of those. You know, I grew up a yuppie kid. I, I pretty much, uh, we, we had everything that we ever wanted and had a very good quality of life. And what's really more importantly, I'm realizing you don't have to lose everything and have so much adversity in your life to have some success and to celebrate it and to exponentially grow it so you can teach others to do the same. And so uh, what did your parents do? Uh, they're, they rocked. I mean, my dad here ran uh, NASCO, which was the biggest shipbuilding company and you know, the country. And then my mom, she was an entrepreneur and she worked at different businesses. And they always just taught me, you know, the common sense principles, but, you know, they didn't always get it. I mean, the same thing. They wanted me to have a better life. When I was 17, after high school, I was, I left home and they go, well, go to college. We'll send you anywhere you want to go. Just tell us where you want to go, write a check. And I said, no, I go, I want to get into sales. I want to get into marketing. I I like people. I'm going to get out there. I don't like school. And my dad looks at me as I'm walking out the door and he goes, boy, you're never going to make a living talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and so, so do you think though, I mean, like growing up, were you a good kid? Were you a bad kid? Like what kind of kid were you growing up? Again, my perception of it was probably different than theirs and theirs is probably different than mine. So in my interpretation, I was amazing. I could walk on water and kill lepers, <laughs> you know, but in real realities, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I mean, so, but, but I would imagine, I mean, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine you, you know, you got probably into a little bit of trouble because you're willing to push the boundaries. You're willing to take risks. You're willing to go things that you wanted. Am I wrong about that? Yeah, to, I mean, the stuff I got in trouble for, I mean, I get, ac- I mean, look at all these trophies and crap. I mean, I, I get accolades for what I got in trouble for as a kid. So that's yeah. my truth. Again, so it's a perception. So my reality was, is I wanted to make money as a kid and I couldn't get a job. So I got the neighbors to give me $10 to mow their lawn. And then I hired the other kids in my neighborhood for five bucks to mow the lawn for me. I was an entrepreneur and I got in trouble for taking advantage of the youth. But again, that's what I do for a living today. So I, 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 my perception might be a little bit different than theirs, but the whole thing is I think from the very onset, that's just the way I thought. And, and did you have a, a mentor growing up? I mean, besides your parents or, I mean, was there anybody that really kind of shaped your thinking as a, as a, as a, as a young man? No, I, I had a lot of, you know, teachers and coaches and things of this nature, but, but when it was, you know, I turned 18. Yeah. When I've got my first job, uh, then I started having amazing mentors. In fact, I wrote a book here somewhere around here called, this is the first book I ever did. It's called the millionaire mentor. And it's all about the mentors that guided me in my youth. And now I mentor inner city kids in San Diego and give back to the community as a whole. And I realize that sometimes all we need is one person to believe in us when we don't believe in ourselves, that we can do amazing things. But again, I think I I have a different life. You know, I was a weird kid. People say, how is it that I've done the things I've done? I just had a mom that told me, hey, you can do anything you put your mind to. I believed it. So if something came up and was a challenge, I just figured I could do it if I put my mind to it. And that was always a mentality. Look, when you... 
you talk about the, the books and all this stuff. Here's the reality of people watching. I can't really read very well. I can't spell. I am dyslexic. Play me words with friends. I promise you'll win. So when you do a book, you write a query letter. It says who you are, what's your message, why an expert who's going to read your book. I, I was turned down by 268 publishers for this book. And the 269th one said, we'll do it, but change the title, the beginning, the middle, and the end. Because I didn't know what I was doing. So I got a ghostwriter. They rewrote it. It went on to become a global phenomenon in all these different languages, which led me now to impact the lives of millions upon millions upon millions of people. And what's really interesting, it had been really easy to quit after 50 or 100 rejections or 150 or, but I realized it's the people that have the knowing. I will not let another person or myself talk me out of what I know to be true. And this one quote in this book has was shared 37 million times already. It says, a dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down becomes a plan. A plan backed by action makes your dreams come true. I'm sure you've seen it on the internet. That's my quote from this book that was turned down 268 times in a row. And so when you, now, now tell me about your family. I mean, do you have kids? You're married? What's, what's, your, what's your situation there? I am happily divorced to one of the greatest ex-wives you could ever imagine. I know most people have all these anger things. I don't. I live in California. We're all cool. And I got probably the coolest ex-wife in the world. And her, her boyfriend, our, her family, and our family, we all get along. And, and it's really neat. We co-parent very well together. Uh, and then I've got a son named Colt. Uh, and he's just a phenomenon. Uh, he's eight years old now, but when he was a kid, seven, he had the number one album on Amazon, Spoken Word. And what happens is every night before he goes to bed, he says a mantra. And then I had a buddy of mine put it to hip hop music, put it out on the internet, and he has his own Spotify channel and it blew up. Go figure, right? <laughs> so, so he basically, so this is something we can find on Spotify and, and like you type up his name yep. and, it'll, and it's kind of like a mantra with music. Correct, it's Colt Reed. And what's really neat, it, 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 he has one called I'm the Businessman. Uh, one's called like Believe in Yourself. I mean, I just was listening to a couple of the other, I haven't even listened to him. I go, holy, this is pretty amazing. So yeah, when, before he goes to bed, he says, my name's Colt. He goes, I'm happy, I'm powerful, I'm brave, I'm wise, I'm worthy, I'm successful, I help people. My name's Colt. So a buddy of mine took it and went like, my name's Colt. Ba -ba -ba -da -ba -ba. I'm happy. Doom, doom. So it's pretty cool. Oh, I love that. That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah, because I mean, even me, I mean, throughout all my years, you know, I have a little thing that I say in the morning, I'm alive, I'm awake, and I feel great. Um, and, and I just, there's, there's something that, you know, just kind of gets you moving in the right direction. Um, uh, every single day, I think about that. And, and I, I feel lucky that, you know, I, that at a young age, at 21 years old, I was able to uh, create a business, become very, very successful. But the most important thing that I think that after all said and done is that we've been able to help other people become successful as well. And, uh, and I, I just, I feel so blessed and lucky that I, I kind of like from a young age, I was taught those type of things. A lot, a lot of, I learned a lot of stuff from Anthony Robbins early on, kind of shaped a lot of my, uh, you know, thinking. Of course, Think and Grow Rich was, was an incredible power, incredibly powerful uh, book for me to read in the beginning. Um, and so, I mean, as far as like, I, I know right now you're a founder uh, and CEO of Work Smart um, advertising firm, right? And so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I sold that business in 2004 or something like that. So that, that, that was one of my first business success that I, I, got a, I, I took from just an inception to a success. And when people, when I sold it, they go, how in the hell did you pull that off? You can't, you're dyslexic. You can't spell. How did you pull this off? And I says, well, I listened to these tapes. I, I went to these seminars. I, I believe in these little chants and, and, and mantras and started applying it. And, and I started speaking at the local universities. And a kid said, you should write a book. I go, that's a great goal. I've never read one. And so I started the journey and here we are. And now I've got to walk on this star on the walk of fame for writing books worldwide. And the whole thing is that if you work your strengths and hire your weaknesses, you can have anything you want. Now, look, I, we only okay, got- wait, 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 wait. Say, say that again. Say that again. Say that again. Work your yeah. what? Say that again. You work your strengths and you hire your weaknesses. And so hire I cannot- your, Oh, I love that. Huge. Yeah. So for, for, for an example, I've got a book. 
right now, you're, this is Wealth on the Beach. I got a book out right now called Wealth Made Easy. Uh, for three years, I interviewed people worth $100 million to a $1 billion and wrote all their stories and to, well, wealth hacks into this book. And the guy I co-authored it with, his name is Gary Krebs. Now, he's the former publisher of McGraw-Hill Publishing Corporation. Who can write a better book, me or that guy, right? When I did this book, the guy writes a curriculum for Princeton University. Who can write a better book, me or that guy? Same as the next, same as the next, same as the next. So I work my strengths and go, pa 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 pa, and then they craft in a way people would want to read it. It's the same thing. If you walk into my house, I'm a bachelor right now. If I picked out all my furniture, everything would be brown. So <laughs> I get all these designers that make it look amazing. So when you walk in, you go, oh, it's glorious, but I had nothing to do with it. Work your strengths, hire weaknesses. But there's like three nuggets I got to share. We only got 15 minutes. So this is it. When Sharon and I did Three Feet from Gold, our biggest takeaway was this. Successful people seek counsel and failures listen to opinion. Opinion is based on ignorance, lack of knowledge, and inexperience, like your family, friends who've never done what you want to do. Counsel is based on wisdom, knowledge, mentorship, people have paved the way. If you go to a family friend and say you're going to write a best-selling book, they're going to talk you out of it to protect you, to keep you safe because you're dyslexic and they've never written a best-selling book. But if I go to Mark Victor Hansen, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, he's going to say, Greg, sit down. Here's what you need to know and give you counsel based on wisdom, knowledge, mentorship. If we would spend our activity only seeking counsel and ignoring people's opinion, that's the day your life would change. And so, uh, so I mean, what would be, because I know a lot of people are probably listening right now, and they're th they've always thought about writing a book, about anything. Maybe it's a cookbook, maybe it's a whatever. I mean, where, where do they start? What's the first step for them to start? Well, I'm gonna give different feedback again, a different counsel than maybe a, a predecessor or somebody else. Here's my answer. Don't write it. Because if you would have, if you're a good writer, you've already done it. So shut the hell up, look at yourself and go, look, I, I, I suck at this thing. So what do you do? And then you go on to upwork.com and you post an ad, say for a thousand dollars, I'm looking for an editor, a ghostwriter to take my words and craft them the way people want to read it. There, there's so many solutions. There are no excuses in today's world. Every single thing we need is at our fingertips right now. It's so funny, you know, I got a major motion picture out and it's streaming on Netflix called Wish Man. And, you know, we're up for, we made the ballad for the Oscars last year and it was pretty cool. And people go, well, it's easy for you because you're connected. I don't know anyone in that business. But what happened is I took out an ad on a website. Don't tell anyone it's a secret website. It's called Craigslist. Shh. And I said, I'm looking for someone to help me write this story. A guy answered the ad wrote the screenplay, directed the movie, helped me produce it, and we've won all these friggin' awards from around the world. And the bottom line, there is no more excuses. It's just taking action because it's the action in law of attraction that makes our dreams come true. Think it, feel it, shut up, get off your backside, do it. Now, law of attraction, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, what, what is it? I mean, because a lot of people say that it's, it's BS, law of attraction it's you know it's 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 like a spiritual thing it's it's you know the whatever it is you know what do you say about what do you what would you say to those people that say law of attraction is bs you think about it and you create it in your mind and then the universe and all that like what, what would you say to those people well i'm not a psychologist and i'm not a therapist but i will say this that's up to you. I mean, if, if you don't believe it, that's your choice. It's the same thing if you don't believe in a higher power, if, or if you believe in the Easter Bunny, that's, that's your choice. It's not my job to change your mind. On the, but for myself and my friends and sphere of influence, we truly believe that energy is energy. And I, I hate to tell you, you know, and your outside per, uh, perception is a great, it just, uh, is a great like you know, Geiger counter for how you're feeling inside. I'll give you an example. If I go to the grocery store and everyone's in a bad mood and everyone's a jerk, chances are that's what you're feeling. If you go to the grocery store and everyone's in a good mood, chances are that's how you're feeling. So to me, I usually look at how I'm seeing other people outside me because that is me. We all need mirrors to remind us who we are. All right, second nugget. I gotta get, get going here because I got three nuggets. I promise you I'm gonna drop for you. This is a big one. I wish I would have learned this early on in life, okay? Um, and by the way, back to the law of attraction before I do this one, is it, we do not attract what we want in life. Everyone just listen to me. You do not attract what you want. You only attract more of what you are. That's it. That's it. And once you understand that and you change who you are, you will attract that accordingly. That's the way the law of vibrations and work, energy, woo-woo, business, science, 
whatever. It's just the way it is. Okay, so here's my nugget. If I could have learned this, like I said, years ago, it would have been everything. CPC. So if everyone listen to this, if you're waiting for a nugget, this is it. This is like the golden gem of golden gems. It's an acronym that stands for C clues, P patterns, C choices. It's so simple. When I explain this to you, you can go, oh my goodness. One, I'm a single guy. I mentioned it before. I go out on a first date. The woman happens to be 20 minutes late. Well, there's a little red flag, but that's a clue. Anything could happen. But if I go on the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth date, every time she's 20 minutes late, that forms the P, which is called the pattern. Now it's my C choice, whether I deal with it, yell at her, break up with her, but it's not her fault. She's just late. Stop trying to change her to fit in your own little paradigm box. But we see people in a bad reputation in business. They cheat your best friend. You do business thinking it'll be different. Things go wrong and you're mad at the person. You saw the clue, you saw the pattern, you made the choice. It's like seeing a rattlesnake rattle, bite your kid's sister, you go to pet it, get bit, and you're mad at the snake. Looking back, rarely are we angry at the relationships that failed or the business things that didn't go good. We're just mad that we stayed in too long because we saw the clue, we saw the pattern, and we made our choices late. The most successful millionaires and billionaires on the planet, the only thing they do, do different, the only thing is they're constantly looking for clues and patterns, and they make their choices lickety-split. Secret knock. What, what's that all about? That's an advanced move. Are you ready for that? Yep, yep. So people kept wanting to meet my friends. So... It, it, this is like a little bragging moment, but I happen to know a lot of amazing people because we do all these different projects and people kept saying, how do I meet your friends? So I started an event in my living room with 12 people. Uh, they said, do I need a ticket? I go, no, it's in my house, living room. Just go bump, 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 secret knock and all that shit. It was a joke. And it took off and it became Forbes Inc. Entrepreneur's top business event in the world for business leaders because it's real life networking. There's no name tags. There's none of that stuff. You have to apply to go. You have to make sure that you bring value to our circle and that we can bring value to you before we even accept you. And once we do, it costs three grand to go. And I will not tell you where it is or who will be there. Nothing. All I will tell you is the date and the city and state. That's it. And so you can make your flight arrangements, but that's it. And then right before the event, I leak where the secret event is and then people show up. But what's nice is when you go, you can just be you. You can wear flip-flops, tennis shoes. You don't have to try to pretend to be anyone because the only people there are the top people. You mentioned going like a, one of these other events like Tony Robbins or people that I truly admire and respect. But there's 20,000 people, but out of that, there's 200 or 300 that are amazing. Secret Knock is just those 300 people. So imagine that if you can, it's like the cool kids table. And so for example, last one I just did, I had President Vicente Fox come in and he didn't want secret service and stuff. So we're sitting on stage, I go, Vicente, I go, you know, tell me, I, I, I will start an interview slow and we're waking our way up. And he says, yeah. I go, I understand you're building me and Trump a wall. I go, thanks a lot for that. He goes, you son of a, and he freaked out. And then he told a story about how Bush and Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell went to his hacienda with a little vial to talk him to go into war in Iraq and how he couldn't see that. And it was so interesting to hear right from someone who experienced it firsthand. We did private Skype with Edward Snowden while he's hiding in Russia, where everyone's saying this stuff, but we actually get to talk to him right from the horse's mouth. And everyone wants a Lamborghini. So we flew in Mr. Lamborghini from Italy so you can actually hang out. So what would it be like to actually go have tacos and you have a clothing brand with the guy who started Ugg Boots or hang out with someone who's actually done what everyone else is talking about? That's what Secret Knock's all about. You go to secretknock.co, fill out the application. I'm telling you right now, it's like nothing you've ever seen. Oh, I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm very excited about that. And I'm, I'm going to tell everybody about that. Um, and and so, you. look, you made this film, right? It's, it's about the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Tell us a little bit about the Make-A-Wish Foundation and, and how impactful that is and has been for, for so many people. You know, people watching this, everybody knows what Make-A-Wish is. And it was interesting. I was doing a book around here. I think it was called Stickability was the one. And I was interviewing Frank Shankwitz, founder of Make-A-Wish. He just passed away a couple of days ago, by the way. Godspeed. And before he passed away, I asked him, I said, what was, you know, what's your wish? And he says, what do you mean? I go, well, you're the founder of Make-A-Wish. What did you ask for? And he said, no one ever asked me. 
I says, well, I'll grant your wish. I go, I go, what do you want? Anything. And he says, I just want my story to be told so my grandkids know I did something. So I said, all right, sign over your life rights. I go, I'll make it into a movie, but just know I've never made a movie. And he trusted me and it took six years and you have no idea the trials and tribulations. But like I said, it turned out unbelievably stunning. Uh, you can watch it on Netflix tonight called Wishman. And uh, it's just a, a great, great example of all that's possible. His message is that everyone can be a hero. Look, you don't need to be a millionaire or a celebrity. You can give a pair of socks to a homeless guy today on the way home. You can stop a bully from fighting. Everyone can do something to have a ripple effect. All right. As we wrap it up, man, I just uh, want to ask you a couple of real quick questions, just whatever pops on your mind. But what, where's your favorite place to hang out? Like, what do you love? What do you love to do? I love my house. I, I like where I live. I've, I've got the coolest bachelor pad you've ever seen in your life. Uh, like I said, my son is is pretty darn cool kid. And so we're that cool neighbor that everyone comes to and we have barbecues and everyone hangs out and we use each other's pools. And over here, I've got every game that you can imagine from, you know, PS5s to pool tables, ping pong, basketball, you name it, everyone comes here to play. So I feel very comfortable in my own little space. Awesome. And uh, ice cream or cake? Always ice cream. There's not even a question of that. Every single day, no matter what. Baskin Robbins, world-class chocolate. Whoa. Favorite song or band? Billy Joel, Vienna. Vienna yeah. waits for you. It's one of the Billy Joel heroes. Yeah. Billy Joel. My guy. It's the song Vienna. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. My, mine's Piano Man. That's my, that's my go-to karaoke song is Piano Man. But I love Billy Joel. Been to several of his concerts. And uh, I mean, just weird. I mean, just as a young child, I mean, he, and he was the generation before me. So, but I just, I don't know, something about Billy Joel just telling those stories. It, it just, uh, just can't get enough. Um, favorite actor or movie? God. Yeah, I, I've, I've got a, I've got a lot of those. Half of them are on the walls over here. But I, I'll show you the coolest little one. Um, I got John Travolta to teach me Pulp Fiction dance live at the Grammys at the, at the City Gala. How cool is that, right? That's cool. Very, very cool. And and, and then favorite food. You know, that changes all the time, but I go to my fan favorite of uh, Crab. I mean, I'm just a huge fan, especially down in San Diego. Uh, there's this thing called Crab Hut and, uh, and the boiling crab. Oh my gosh, it's absolutely incredible. When people come from out of town, especially when the restaurants are open, that is our spot that we always go hang. Wow. Good stuff, man. Well, this has been so much fun to hang out with you today. The great Greg Reed. Um, I, I mean, I, what a pleasure. What, what an honor. What a I got one more nugget, though. All you right, got, one more got, nugget. Give me my last nugget. All right. Okay. My, fa my favorite interview, because people always ask, what's the biggest one I've ever done? There's so many of them, but this is a good one for everybody, okay? I got to sit down with uh, Steve Wozniak, who created Apple Computer with Jobs. And I said, how did you guys create so much success? And he says, we embraced our lack. He goes, most people run from their adversity what they don't have, and we ran for it. He said, when microchip processor chips came out, they were so expensive, we could only afford one chip. He goes, Jobs sold his Volkswagen. I sold my calculator, pulled our money. We bought one chip. He goes, Hewlett Packard would make machines that go from point A to B with 20 chips because they had all the money of God. He said, so I'd pull away five and go to A to B with 15. I'd pull away five and get it to work with 10. Eventually, we went from A to B with our one chip. He goes, we were not trying to be aerodynamic or compact or cool. We could afford one chip. He goes, but by embracing that as an opportunity, we found the shortest, cleanest path. And by doing that, we changed the way people do personal computing for the rest of the world for the rest of their life. He said, where could you be right now in your own life, your own business? If you stop looking at something as your greatest challenge and obstacle, but it might just be the greatest blessing and opportunity in disguise. Amazing. All right. How do we get a hold of you, man? How, how, do, how does everybody hang out with Greg Reed and, and, and sign up and websites and Instagram? How, how do we get a hold of you, man? 
Yeah, you you can Google all that stuff. The people though that are watching this right now and saying, hey, I want to come play with your friends, come. Only one of you watching this is going to do it, by the way. And that's cool because like I said, it's a small select group. But you don't have to be a Gadilly nerd to come hang out with us. You have to be ready to willing to take actions with the information that you're going to get. It's all about the application. So you go to secretknock.co and you fill it out. And I promise someone to call you back face to face and, and get to make sure that we can be of uh, value back to you. And those of you who want to follow on Instagram, it's Greg S. Reed. You direct message me and I'll get back to 100%. Here's my only rule. I don't talk about the weather. I don't want to talk about how we're doing. I don't want to talk about what you ate for dinner. But if you sit there and say, hey, what book should I read? I'm working on this business. Who do you know that can hook me up? I promise I'll get back to you 100%. Deal? Thank you so much, Greg. Hey, everybody, uh, you make sure you go out there right now. Go follow Greg Reed. Let's get a bunch of people at that secret knock. And, uh, and as always, dream bigger than ever. Get after it and do it now. God bless you. We will see you at the top.